Oh no, this is a bit of a subsection of what Rick highlighted overall. So there's lots of amazing changes coming in 2.0. Uh, but this is really focused on what these changes mean for charmers and how this affects um, new people charming, things to look for to start adding to charms if you're creating them. Uh, people who've already created charms, things you want to consider adding to those to make them better. Um, a lot of you here are here for various reasons. Some of you are our charm partners who are helping to write your software and bring it into our charm ecosystem. Some of you here are interested in Juju and want to learn more about it. Some have been writing charms for a while and may even be Juju charmers. Are, um, so thank you all for being here. I really appreciate it. Um, the first thing I want to talk about is charm tools. Uh, anyone here who's written a charm or who started looking at charms has likely come across this tool. Charm Tools is what we use, is a, is a tool that we created for charm authors to make it really easy to build and maintain the charms that, um, that you're writing. So Charm Tools is really here to be a, much like Juju is for the operator to do and run commands as clouds, Charm Tools is here to make it real simple to manage that stuff. So we're planning a Charm Tools 2.0. Some of the slides that Rick showed were things like uh, charm push and charm publish. Uh, those are all new charm commands that are coming into this charm tools purview. So the ability to rapidly iterate and publish your changes to the store are one of the many things we're bringing to 2.0. In addition to stuff, uh, Rick, oh, that's out of space. Go back one. Um, ah, fortunate. There's a slide out of order. This is, but. The main thing that Charm Tools 2.0 is really going to be doing outside of the publish workflow and outside of the pushing of charms are the ability to create real quickly a template that you can start working off of. So we do that currently. You can type charm create and you get a whole bunch of a skeleton of boilerplate. Uh, and a lot of that is the charms, the hooks, directories, and a bunch of empty files saying fill me in. With layers, that's a bit of an obsolete pattern. It's, a, it's a more of a classic pattern. Layers make it really easy to build out that boilerplate structure and generate it every time you wish to. So Charm Create and Charm Tools 2.0 will be how do I easily assemble, what's, what's the boilerplate for even a layer of a solution I'm trying to provide? So let's say a common, a common application we come across that people are deploying are things like PHP applications. There are hundreds of them. Whether you like PHP as a language or not, PHP is a, is a language with a foundation that a lot of applications are being built on. So we will have something like Charm Create, a PHP app layer where it has all the declarations of all the layers you need to include, the PHP layer to install PHP, uh, <laughs> probably either Apache or Nginx layer, the base layer, all those layers will already be declared, and it'll provide you with some helpful hints on how you can get started writing the reactive patterns you need to, to respond to the right events, to lay down that PHP application. And there are various other uh, mediums. If you're writing a, a, a big data plugin solution, so if you have a solution that plugs into a big data stack, building out a, a layer skeleton that has all of the layered components you need to include already uh, to connect to that stack gets you started even quicker. So that's something that we're adding to Charm Creates. Uh, we're also helping to expand the things that Charm Build currently do. So when you build a Charm, making it uh, much easier, much more robust, and much more observable, that pattern. So those are a couple of things that are coming in Charm Tools 2.0 uh, that we're really excited about. If you've started using Charm Tools or you have feedback, this, this isn't good, this is great, or I want to see more of this, Please come find me or any of the other charmers and say, this is a cool feature I think we should have in charm tools. I think having X, Y, or Z will make it really easy for me to write charms. The next thing that I'm really excited about and that I think will really help the charm story is resources. And Rick spent a good amount of time talking about resources, but I'm really excited to show a couple of the examples of what it means for a charm to be able to say, I have a charm and the charm is the code of how I manage that life cycle of that service. But the application revs outside of the code of the logic that you need to install and manage it. So resources are the way that you can deliver not just the application source code, but many of the under underlying, underlying components that are needed for that in a reliable, repeatable, and offline way. So this is an example of a resource uh, outlined for an application you see in the MendidyAML, kind of a snippet. Uh, we have an application. And maybe in addition to the source code application, you also deliver a Docker container. This just happens to be a way that we deliver software repeatedly is in our Docker container file. But this could be anything. This could be tar GZs, it could be a set of dependencies, it could be I need to lay down Java as a, as, a, as a dependency and that has to come from Oracle and there's a bunch of applications there. We have to get that into the system. So having a, a reliable, repeatable way to declare that is something we're very excited for coming in 2.0 and we really expect to see a lot of uptake from people who are deploying these applications. Um, and it's really easy once you have declared the resource to get it in the charm. 
Before, if you re re fetched a remote source in order to get through our policy review, not only did you have to make sure you fetch that source from a reliable endpoint, but it also had to be cryptographically verified and assigned and make sure that you do the best you can to ensure the application or the, the payload you're downloading is the one you expect to get. Because at the end of the day, your code's going into production systems and to user deployments, we've got to make sure that it's reliable and it is secure. With this, we now have all of that complexity of how do I know that this payload's the right one, how do I know that it's the, the one I, I want it to get, all of that is resolved at the Juju level. So now it's modeled by Juju, so that that level of complexity is no longer managed in the charm code. And there's no longer individual implementations that how to handle each one of these things. Uh, where you're fetching a remote resource or grabbing stuff from PIP or grabbing stuff from another package archive, all that stuff can now be distilled in the model with Juju. That's something we're very excited for. Um, and then resource publishing the source. So Rick went over this a little bit, but when you publish your charm, you publish it with resources. You can rev resources outside of the charm published. So if you don't change the operational code, but there's a new release of the software, it just works with the old code, you could just publish that new resource. And then the users who are running that will get a notification saying, ah, there is a new version of this resource. Do you want to upgrade the charm with this version of that resource? And they'll be able to just upgrade that payload. The charm code can handle that logic. And then you've got a new version of the application without having to upgrade the entire charm code for that. So it's a great way to deliver uh, <coughs> updates to your application in that concise delivery pattern. Yeah. So uh, what does this mean for the Git URL fetch handler? Or the fetch handlers in general? So fetch handlers are a way that, for instance, I got a clone, I got a clone a GitHub repo, or I got to clone something from source and build it. Uh, you'd still be able to do that. We're not saying you aren't going to be able to do that, but we'd highly recommend that you instead take the Git resource and put it as a tar GZ and then publish it into a resource because for those of us who have to deploy into enterprise environments where limited ingress and egress filtering is applied, it's really hard to fetch from GitHub and to make that use case. But this allows them to say, well, I need the software that they can on a laptop in the DMZ download it. They can do the security vetting, say this is the version I want. And then with the next slide, when they deploy, they can deploy that charm with the resource they fetched offline and embedded themselves. So they can circumvent what's even published in the store. So this gives enterprise customers a way to lock, or any real customer, doing production. I don't always want to run the insane crap thing upstream is telling me. We got a version, we got to do the one version before where we vet that process. And this makes it really easy as well to build a CI pipeline. For when you do CI and CD, you can use charms to model that topology through each stage. And with resources, you can say, well, we have this stable version, but let's pipe in the latest trunk and see what happens when it goes through our, our vetting process. So that really enables that kind of iterations and those workflows when you have it distilled down that model. So we won't see Git handlers go away, but during reviews, we will highly suggest that resources will lead the way to take it. Right now, if you go back to the previous slide, resources support only just a file, which is basically just a blob you deliver. Um, that file could be a zipped up archive, but I imagine as we get more feedback, because files are kind of the primitive that we can boil everything down to, eventually supporting other mechanisms where it wasn't just a file, but maybe even repositories or other such, I don't know what else goes outside of a file, but that, that idea may, we can evolve that because we've allocated the language for that kind of file name or file typing in there. So two slides forward. Uh, terms. This is one that Rick did touch on, but it's kind of a small thing, but it actually makes a big impact for a lot of people, especially people who are bundling in commercial or, or enterprise or not necessarily free open source readily available and licensed software. So terms is the way that you can get users to accept licenses on behalf for you. Um, the example I use is something like a, a Java application. So if you're building a Java application, you can run and install OpenJDK, but sometimes you want to recommend that you run a different Java. And there's OpenJDK, Oracle has a Java, IBM has their own Java. If you're doing IBM applications on top of Power8, you'll want to use their Power8 optimized Java likely. Each one of those comes with a unique set of licenses. So what you can do is have this define your metadata where you say the terms that the user must agree to prior to even being able to deploy the software has to be the terms defined as the Oracle Java term and the software EULA term, which is just a EULA for this specific cool Java application. So when you define these as a charm author, you upload alongside the charm the actual terms and conditions the user is expected to accept. So if you go to the next slide, when a user deploys, tries to deploy a cool job application for the first time, Juju will say you have to agree to these terms. And Juju will be able to know that you've agreed to these terms as a user. 
So when you say I want to jo agree to the Java, the Oracle Java uh, term, the ter entire term as a EULA will be presented. Everyone should read it. I imagine most will press page down and type yes. Um, but you essentially have to agree to it at deploy time, or you have to agree to it prior to deploy time before you can deploy can that software. Yeah. Then you can deploy Cool Java app. Well, once you've agreed to software EULA, and it'll just work. And it'll work for every time that term, that agreement is presented in Charm. So you accept it once, and it's applicable to any Charm that includes that term sheet. Um, this is a great way for us to get around a lot of questions we've had where, you know, you, it's a bit of a gray area legally where it says, you know, that we've had configuration options which say, do you accept these terms? Uh, you have to switch it to yes, and then we just echo Y to the term sheet thing during install. Uh, all that kind of goes away. It makes it very clean and, and much, much easier to, to present to people who have these terms that you must accept for software. A series of metadata. This is just a nice feature that's long. Oh, yeah, go back one. Yep. That's a fantastic question. I'm not a core developer, so I can't answer it. But the agreeing of terms and deploying of software is detached from each other. So what I imagine what you're really looking for is kind of like a pre-step process where it says, I want to deploy this thing. Is there anything that's going to hang me up? And then you can say, okay, well, I'll agree to all the terms that need to be agreed there. So we might be able to build maybe a plug-in for the time being that we eventually model how that would look for someone. Like something like Juju, are there any terms in this bundle I'm about to deploy? Please check for me, which is a very long thing. Um, but that would go through and check the charms, and we query the charm store and say, are there terms? Has this user agreed to those terms yet? And those, those metrics. Yeah, so I don't, I'm not, I'm not, not sure. sure. When you're doing like an automated deployment, yeah. and the bundle gets updated, but you don't notice that somebody didn't put terms in there somewhere. Right. Like six months later, somebody gets like half a big point, and it just stops it. It's because it's wasting the feedback, and the reality is the feedback, especially from like a continuous of course, yes. Um, that's fantastic feedback. I've not considered that situation, so I don't really have an answer for you. Um, any, can anyone from the core team, any opinions, feedback? No? Okay. We'll find out the answer for you by the end of the day, though, for sure. If, if there is a mechanism, if not, we'll make sure it's on the roadmap so that doesn't foul up anyone doing auto deployments. Um, but great question. Corey. Right, so it just opens up a lot of a lot of paths for people who want to deliver maybe a more commercial version of the store where you get a, a free version up front, you can, anyone can deploy and try out, but move forward to agreeing the license and using resources to distribute a more commercial version. It's a great point. Series of metadata. So Rick touched on this a bit. Um, it is awesome. If you've ever seen the OpenStack charms in deployment flight, it's a lot of branches of a lot of the same code over and over and over again. So the OpenStack guys have worked really hard to instill inside of each of the charms what it means not only install all of the versions of OpenStack, which every six months a new version, um, which sounds a bit familiar to me, but you have the, the one that most people are deploying on things like Icehouse, which is almost four years old now, three years old, and every version in between, which is every six months a new and new version. So they have in the charm from Precise, which is our previous previous long-term support release, 2012 we released that version of, of Ubuntu, all the way up through Trusty, which is our current long-term support release, which was two years ago, and starting to add support now for Xenial, which is the next one coming out in April. They support not only all of those series, but different permutations of OpenStack installs on those series as it makes sense. This is a very complex matrix of support that they've taken the time to instill as code. But in order for them to deliver a charm for Precise and Trusty and Xenial and Wiley and uh, all of these different versions, they have to copy the source trees out in different branches. This goes away with series of metadata because, as Rick showed, 
Now you just declare, these are the series this charm supports, and it's in one code, one time reused over and over again. So if you've taken the time to make sure that the charm is supported across multiple series, we're going to make sure it's really easy for you to give that to your users without having to add a bunch of overhead burden. So you don't have to worry about making different branches or creating different repos or different directory trees, et cetera. So a lot of the directory tree stuff that we've had to do previously to get around this goes away. Uh, this makes it a really nice story for people that are, are adding that support across uh, OSs. But just like Juju uh, supports multiple operating systems as well, it makes a really strong story for things like this case, where you have a lot of different slices and flavors of a single version of an operating system. So in this case, Windows applications, uh, there's quite a bit still. Enterprises are still using things like Active Directory. It's still very much a thing that gets deployed and managed, and that's not an easy solution to solve. And the cloud-based guys have worked really hard to make Windows integration with Juju really simple and provide a lot of charms that you can use. Hyper-V and OpenStack is available because of the cloud-based guys. But they have the same similar problem, is that there are multiple versions of Windows. These are all basically the same thing in one form or another. One's a little lighter than the other, one's Rev 2 or Rev 1. But now it makes it really easy to say we support Windows 2012 and all of the permutations that that comes with in this charm. So that's that. Supported features is, a, is something that Rick didn't talk about, but it is something that is really helpful for charms, especially as charm authors when you're starting to consume those latest features of the bleeding end version of Juju that may not have made it all the way down to those longer running instances. We still have a few customers and, and users that are running on not, we're at 125 now, but there's still people using 122 and 123, and there are new features that are coming into Juju that may not exist in those just yet. So supported features makes it really easy to say that I've got this crazy big application that has to use leader election. And leader election is a relatively new feature in Juju. It didn't come out until 122 or 23, so if you're running an older version, you don't have leader election. This service just simply won't work on that version of Juju. So for now, we've been doing a lot of work in the code space, in the charm, to do fallback mechanisms to manage leadership election. <laughs> so we were able to make that possible while not breaking previous versions of charms with people who use leadership election. But we have features coming to Juju which you can't easily backwards compatible model. Things like storage and networking are not easy to build fallback mechanisms for. So in charms now, you can declare that this charm uses XYZ feature and it has to be there in that version of Juju in order to support it. So if a, a customer goes on an old version of Juju, Juju deploy this charm, and Juju determines that this version doesn't support all the features you've declared, it'll let the user know, or it'll try to fall back to an older charm that has those features available, so the user can still deploy that. But they won't get a broken experience, they'll be informed why they can't deploy, and they can make the decisions on how they want to manage that. It also supports the idea of showing required and optional features. So, for instance, this could use storage, but it doesn't need storage in order to function properly, but it is enhanced with storage. And that allows the operators to make decisions on, you know, they'll let them know, this needs storage, but you don't have it, and it gives that kind of feedback that you may not get the full experience you'd expect, but it should still work. Uh, yeah? Does anyone get a list of those accepted terms and their proper spelling? Um, and one of the commands coming in 2.0, I think, is something like Juju List Features, which shows all the features you can respond to, something in that fashion. We'll also make sure it's very clearly documented on the website uh, and how that kind of maps down in the matrix there. Uh, so the next thing that we're doing is a bit outside of core. It's the review queue. Who here has submitted a charm to the review queue before? All right, a few of you have. Did you, did you have a good time doing it? What? Oh, it wasn't that bad. <laughs> so with things like Publish and Charm, push where you're able to upload real quickly to the charm store, to development branches, and to your personal namespace, there's no longer a need to do the current process which requires you to learn Bazaar as, as Rick mentioned, uh, which if you're not familiar with, may be a bit jarring from tools you've been using previously. Once you know that, you have to push and sign into Launchpad, push into Launchpad, into a very specific branch path. Then you have to go to another website, wait for it to show up in there, and then wait for review, and the review process all happens out of band. It's a bunch of tools kind of cobbled together to solve a problem. So we're simplifying that, much like Charm Push simplifying that author workflow. And so the new review queue is going to be a much simpler experience. Uh, we have a quick demo. Um, it is a demo that's more of a functionality demo, less so of a look at this beautiful beta thing. Uh, so this is pre-alpha. So there is no, there's no theming, there's no skinning, there's nothing really on here. It's just more to show what the workflow would look like for people submitting charms to show how easy it'll be, not just to see where your charm is in this review queue process, but to start that feedback and to go through and see what I need to do, 
whose actions responsible? Am I waiting for someone to look at my charm? Do I need to do something with this charm? And then have a clear path forward to see what things need to be done and then get it into the store as soon as possible. So I'll let Tim, who's been working primarily on this, kind of walk through this portion here. Yeah, so um, Marco actually already said half of my work. <laughs> <laughs> so, it's a <laughs> day of <laughs> 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 um, I wasn't sure, I saw like three games for who's been through the review process, but how many non-canonical people have actually been through the review process? Anyone in here? Because if you haven't... I made a few good attempts, man. Okay, well hopefully it'll get easier and less painful, but I mean part of the pain today was that you were kind of bound to Launchpad whether you liked it or not. You got to get your code in Launchpad, then you have to go submit a merge proposal or a bug request just to get your item up for review. Um, remember too that the review process is not mandatory, you don't have to do it. Uh, by default when you publish your charm it's going to go into your personal namespace and that's fine, you can use it, it'll work great. If you want to get into the recommended namespace, the top level namespace, you have to have you have to go through this community review process. So um, today we already have a version of this um, that this is operational today. So if you've been through the review process, this might look familiar. Um, what we are doing is retooling it a little bit to fit with the new published stuff that Rick was talking about earlier. So, like I said, today, to get into the review queue today, you have to submit a merge proposal and launch path. Um, the new process will just be push your charm up to your personal namespace, and then come to the review queue and actually submit your item for review. So there's no ingestion process. You just go to the review site and say, hey, I want my thing to be community review so I can get into the recommended namespace. So we just submit it here, and I'm not going to pause it. Better. So you submit it, it comes in. I'm not going to submit one right now, but I'm just going to hop over to this will be a list of reviews that are in flight. And I'll just drill into the one sample one that I have here. So you'll see the current status of this review right now. This one's in need fixing. So um, some of the details are yet to be ironed out, but in general, this is going to be a community review process. So if you can log in via Ubuntu SSO, like Rick was saying, you can participate in the review process. Um, so what we'll be looking for here is uh, a review will need a plus two overall vote in order to be approved and then uh, promulgated into the official chart namespace. So I'm just going to walk through a few details of what we see on the screen here. When your review comes in, you're going to get automated testing for free. So Matt mentioned this in his testing talk on Monday, if any of you caught that. When your item comes into the review queue, we'll automatically push tests off to Jenkins. So any tests that you have in your charm will immediately be launched in Jenkins. And as they complete, you'll start to see test results here show up in the review itself. So where results is blank here, this will be a link. And one improvement they're going to make over the current review queue, which will give you a link to a Jenkins log, which will disappear at some point, and you'll wonder what the heck happened to my test results. Um, planning to make that, instead of a link to the Jenkins log, a link to parsed test results that won't disappear. So you can actually, they'll stick with the review. You can see a little bit easier what happened with your test results. So. That, yes. Yeah, uh, consuming tests, like let's say your test fails, God forbid. Yeah. And how could you trigger that test to run again at a certain point when your charm has already been ingested? Okay, so there's there's a couple things there. Um, you can see faintly there under the test results table, there's a drop down start test. If you're a charmer, you can kick off a new set of tests manually there. So if you're not a charmer, you can just ping a charmer and say, hey, retest my thing. But the other thing is, if you've got a charm under review and there's bugs in it or a test failed and you realize, oh, hey, I need to fix something, <coughs> you can simply upload a new revision of that charm to your namespace and it will automatically be ingested by the review queue. So we'll see, oh, there's a new revision of this thing, we'll suck it in and it will become part of the review. And when that happens, new tests will be kicked off for that revision. <laughs> Is that currently uh, working? Well, this is all work in progress right now. Um, oh, right. So, so that functionality is part of this it. is planned for this, yeah. 
And how are the tests run? I mean, is there an expected make file target or okay, a yeah, test so, program? Yeah, or? great question. The question is how are the tests run? Or is there an expected make file target? Or how do you know what's going to be tested? Um, we're using a Python project called Bundle Tester, which you can run against any charm or bundle, and it will automatically detect any tests in that charm or bundle. So that includes any executable files in the test directory of that charm. And it will also sniff out make targets like make lint, make test. It will also run charm proof for you to lint your charm. So there's a lot of stuff that you get for free there. Um, moving on quickly, this has you know standard features like commenting. So again, if you're, yes? Uh, are there any limitations on the resources that test will control? Like in terms of how many containers that we use? Um, well, theoretically, no. What can, uh, can, uh, we have test clouds set up to run this stuff, and I don't think we've run into a case yet where we ran out of resources. But that's something that we'd be keeping an eye on to see. You know, do we ha have enough resources to run the tests, and if not, rectify the situation. Unless you're spinning up time. Sorry. In terms of time, how much time? Yeah, so it depends. I mean, we're pretty liberal with that right now. Um, there, are, I've seen tests that took four hours and still succeeded for like some of our big complicated charms like Postgres and Cassandra. But typically, they're quite a bit shorter than that—30 minutes to an hour. So. I mean, uh, it would be nice for the guys that review the charms to actually have the tests now to look at the things. Right, so that is part of what this will do. I mean, it's kind of, if you are interested in contributing by reviewing a charm, you, you would come in here and say, oh, you know, this is retry right now, but typically they would say running or finished. So you can see if this has still got running tests, then don't review it yet. Let's, you know, wait and see what the tests say before you start your review. So, yeah. And we could do things like in the review queue, since we control the whole process, we can make it really easy to surface this charm has all the tests that have passed and is ready for review. We should float it higher up in priority than reviews that are still running tests or have failed tests. Theoretically, if a test has failed, there's an actionable item by the charm author who submitted it to go and fix that charm or look into it. And if it failed for dubious reasons because clouds are transient by nature, then it'll be a process from the kickoff of the test. But since we control this process, it's no longer bound to what Launchpad is, which is a really good project management, bug tracker, code sourcing, planning software. This is really a review platform where we can make better decisions on how we get reviews to the people who need to review and get and feedback to the people who need to get feedback and have stuff iterated on. So it's, it's a good point. Right now, it's all linear. It's by the time submitted, so we go top down, and sometimes the next item in the queue is failed test, and really we're just waiting for the author to update that item. So we can be much smarter in how we implement that kind of sorting algorithm now that we have all of that data in one platform. Yeah. That, good question. Thanks. Um, so getting back to where we're, you can, you know, if you're logged in, you can comment on the review. You can contribute that way. Because I was the person who submitted this charm for review, I can't vote on it. Um, this box here, I can change the status to... Um, to need to review again. If I push a new revision, I could say, hey, set changes to need to review so I can get eyes on it again. If I was somebody who didn't own this charm, I would, that would instead be a voting drop down so you could vote like minus one, plus one, um, et cetera. Okay, the next part, reviewers checklist. This is a new thing that we don't have in the current review queue. Um, it's going to be much bigger than this probably, but this is just a limited sample. Um, what we're going to do is try and make the reviews as objective as possible by taking our charm store policy, which is in our, in our documentation, and um, kind of encoding that into some things that can be easily checked off as pass or fail. So, so that as the review is ongoing, and you can check, can you check on a couple of those? Um, people who are reviewing, they can say, okay, I've checked that, um, well, we've got a failing test, or I've, I've reviewed all the hooks and I can verify that they're item potent, so I'm going to check that off. So that 
as you have multiple people coming in to participate in the review of this charm, we don't have 10 people all reviewing the same thing. First, somebody who's reviewed it already can just check that off and nobody else has to uh, check that thing. Finally, we'll have diffs here. This is, I mean, the current review queue doesn't have diffs because everything has to be in uh, Bazaar, so we do the diffs on Launchpad. We'll have inline diffs here with inline commenting, things that you would expect from a code review, co code review tool. Um, so if you've got a brand new charm, the diff will basically be all green because it's not in the charm store yet. If you're making an update to an existing charm that's already in the recommended namespace, it would be a diff against what's already there. Um, that is about it. I, you know, reviews are hard. Code reviews are subjective. Um, so, you know, people have different opinions about what's good and what's not good. I'm hopeful that some of the other things that are coming, like we've got layers now, so you can have a lot less boilerplate in your charms. The, the code that's actually being reviewed should be a lot thinner. It should make reviews go faster and be simpler. Um, the feature flag thing that Marco just talked about, you won't have a bunch of code that's like checking for features and doing one thing or another. Resources, you won't have to manually download your resources into your charm. That'll be done for you. So all these new features will, will bring the actual amount of code in the charms down, which should help the reviews go a lot more smoothly. Um, this is still a work in progress. There's nothing for anybody to play with yet. As we get into a beta stage, we'll be looking for community feedback for sure on the mailing list and IRC. Um, looking for, as we get into this, how do you like it? Is it going well? Does it suck? Should we change it? What should we change? And stuff like that. So your feedback on that will be greatly appreciated. Are there any more questions before I pass it back to Marco? Yeah. How do layers affect the review process? Uh, in the sense that when an author writes a charm, he might use like five layers that have been already reviewed. Is that the way that you can just add only one? Like, yeah. Uh, OK. Uh, like, does this affect the way that you is going? Like, can he, can the, the, the author say, OK? This is the new one. This is the next yeah. one. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, Mark and I have talked about that a little bit, and we don't have any special handling of that right now, but since this is a review tool that's going to be specific to charms, we can make it smart specifically for charms. So one idea is, in the case of layer charms, to minimize the diff down to just the layer that's being built and not the entire built charm. So I'm hopeful that we can get features like that in there where we can make the reviews as easy as possible. Does that answer the question? Okay. Brand Just a clarifying question. Anyone can review from, correct? Yes, if you can log in through Ubuntu SSO, then you can participate in a review. But only charmers can vote. Only charmers can actually say, I'm going to now promulgate this to the charm store. So the charmer is kind of the last gateway. Yeah. But yeah. That answers the question. A second question. Are there any plans to integrate the queue as a view in the charm store? So, so to get exposure on perhaps charms that are in a queue, more eyeballs knowing that those charms are in a queue? Is that the yeah, I, you're talking about? That, I haven't talked to anyone about that idea, but I think it's a good idea. And like, uh, talking to Rick about it. So maybe accidentally people might stumble on hey, there's a bunch of charms in here. Yeah. Whereas, they're not looking at a queue. Yeah, sure, so about. right now it's, it's pretty much, if you go to jujucharms.com, we see that very much as user based right. people consuming charms and deploying services. Um, one thing we have is we have a bunch of developer and community focused sites that are all kind of pinned around jujucharms.com. You notice we have a juju.solutions name where we kind of camp out as the development community. Uh, one of the things we're trying to do in the next coming months is to really make the developer experience also a part of jujucharms.com. So jujucharms.com slash developer should really give you insights to how do I write charms, where's the broader community, how's the review queue run, uh, and give that kind of insights there. So while it may not be directly on the store page, tying that into to the main property is one of the things that we're looking to do in the next coming months, especially as we've kind of now have these new methodologies and plans that start tying a bit more to the charm store, layers being built for charms in the store and, and such of that nature. But, um, the layers things we're watching very closely. We are now seeing a lot of charms being written layer, a lot more than I think we initially expected. We're happy to see that continue to grow. But we still have a lot of people that are updating and maintaining classic charms. 
and we don't expect them to change, and to some degree, that's okay with us. Um, you know, we're not asking you to rewrite anything from any other tool. Why would we ask you to rewrite the entire <coughs> charm that you've already got a solid solution for? So this will support all charms as they are in their base format, which is that classic full payload thing. But we'll be working to make it, a, a, if you are writing layers, a much better process for people reviewing to get past that kind of boilerplate pieces. So those are all things that we're watching, but they probably won't be for the first release of this. Likely, I don't know, you could do like two weeks after the first release, right? <laughs> so that's something we're all watching though as, we, as, as layers evolve and as we continue revamping this review queue process. And is there any review process for the layers? Uh -huh. Yeah. Good so we question. had a discussion on this on the mailing list recently, um, and the general feedback was, we should. There's so many great things coming, and layers are evolving so quickly that adding a review process would maybe cumbersome that process a bit. So, while we don't have a formal review process, we do have a charmer's namespace that we own layers that we feel very confident are ready for people to use, uh -huh. and then we have that same concept of a personal namespace of layers. So, um, like for instance. Chuck wrote a uh, Ansible layer in a day. That's not going to go in that Charmer's namespace. That's not something we would recommend yet, but we want to make sure we can publish it to that interface so people can see it, start using it, collaborating. The, the site where we hold our layers, interfaces.juju.solutions, um, is kind of a, a full repository of all the layers that anyone can use. So we are working on the idea of how do we start adding that, that same level of quality checking that we have for Charms down in that layer process. And that's something we really want the community to define what they think would be the best way to keep accelerating the number of layers that we have available so people can build charms quickly, but also still provide that quality aspect. So it's a discussion that's ongoing. So, yeah. It's just a suggestion that the layers um, have been through that quality process when they are used in the charm that's in the charm store. Yes. So maybe you could connect those two. And you put a layer that's used in some charms in the charm store is automatically approved yeah. or recommended. So that's something we considered. One thing that we one thing that we really wanted to make sure we're doing is when we have layers, we're gathering metrics about those layers. So because the build process leaves that layer artifact, which defines this charm was built with these layers, mm -hmm. we have that ability to introspect. We know, you know, how first of all, how many charms are using layers because they all have that kind of base layer. But then how many charm how many charms are built using this specific component. It turns out there's a lot of Nginx in our charm stack because we can see that this is the amount of times that that instance of Nginx exists in the store. So we will be using those metrics. We are collecting them. We're not sure quite how we want to shape that experience, but it is definitely another avenue. We can say this solution is used 25 times in the charm store for these 25 charms that all pass review and they all pass tests. This is probably okay for you to use in your layer, whereas this one's only used once and this may be a good place for you to collaborate to, to make sure it works really well. But that's, a, that's an awesome uh, thought, yeah. yeah. Would it be possible to add some automatic tests to the, to the review queue? Mm -hmm. So for example, to test this, but if a hook is added potent, that's something that can, that can be automated, so. We have talked about a lot of things, and the, the things we often find them talking about is, how do we just make sure hooks are potent? How do we make sure interfaces are always responding in the right protocol? And a lot of that work was solved by we push things into layers. Hook item potency is solved because we have declarative states inside of charms. As long as charms respond to those declarative states, so we can just run events over and over and over again and make sure that things are in a consistent state and not always changing, and they're responding properly, we model item potency. And now that interfaces are modeled as code as interface layers, you have standard interface testing that you can do there. Every charm implements that interface, which provides both the how do I provide this endpoint, how do I connect this endpoint as code in one library. We can unit test that, we can function test it, and we can make sure that it doesn't change to break that protocol. So those those layers really was born a lot of that, that fact of interfaces are hard to test for communicating. And then how do we test that stacks are impotent? Well, responding to events and managing item potency at a code level is a bit tedious. And a lot of charms start just writing their own state search. They just maybe touching files on a, on a thing. I've already installed my dependencies and this and this. So we condensed all those ideas that were kind of growing from that into that reactive pattern where you just declare states, set and remove them, and then react to when they are either set or not or a combination of both. Um, so that's how we're doing. Theoretically, I guess we could inject some idea of item potency <coughs> testing by just rerunning every hook twice and making sure it works. Um, but yeah, we're very much looking to see how we can expand our 
testing infrastructure, just running the test proposed, to also maybe mixing a little bit of chaos into that, see how it really responds under maybe a more production load and that was yeah. modeled by the tests. But another good observation as well. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> cool. Thanks, Tim. I appreciate the walkthrough there. Um, Tim will be here all day, so if you have any questions about the review process or feedback, if you've used the review process and you found it to be cumbersome and tedious, we really welcome that feedback. We really want to make this experience great for everyone. I mean, we use these tools all day, we feel some of the burden, we go and we try to find fixes for them, but we're mostly consumers on the other end. We like to see the people who are using them and getting in there every day and how we can make it better for you all. Because at the end of the day, the Charter Community Team, myself and several others, are here to serve you all and, and the ecosystem team in general. So, next slide, yes. Oh, that's that slide that was out of place. That's the charm tool slide. I don't know how I looked down there. Um, then finally, I guess to summarize, because it's good, we've actually built the full slot. Um, I'm afraid we may have a little light on content since Rick kind of sniped a lot of the things I want to talk about. Um, help. How do you get help in general? So a lot of you here are new to charming, new to juju. Uh, some of you here are a bit of veterans of charms and veterans of juju. But how do you get help? Uh, we actually have quite a nice blossoming community of people both canonical and otherwise, that are using Juju, that have experience, and that are ready to help. So if you're looking for help, we are in a lot of places. Um, you can find us first and foremost on the mailing list. Uh, there's a lot of great people having a lot of great conversations about different things that are missing from the Charm Store, layer design, uh, getting help on problems. There's an ongoing thread right now about, I don't have a hard time following because I'm not an OpenStack expert, but walking through a, a specific misfire on an OpenStack install from somewhere with a unique networking situation. It's interesting to see the support that's coming out, people who have also experienced these problems and how they've solved them. We're also on uh, Pound Juju on freenode.net, IRC server. There's millions of IRC clients. If you're like Rick, there's plenty for the terminal. If you're like me, there's a GUI app you can install. There's also a web-based version. Feel free to pop on there. A lot of canonicals distributed across the world. A lot of Juju Charmers are also distributed. Um, we're in the US, we're in Europe, uh, we're in Asia as well. So depending on your time zone, most likely than not, someone will be around that you can poke to answer questions. Uh, also, ask Ubuntu. Uh, anyone here use Stack Exchange, Stack Overflow, Server Fault? Yeah, yeah, right. Programming resources. Ask Ubuntu is a Stack Exchange site. Uh, we went through the incubation process, it's been around for a long time. A lot of generic Ubuntu questions on there. We also have a Juju tag. You ask a question, you tag a Juju, someone's going to get that notification. And we find it's a great place to ask questions. We also do a lot of self documentation. I ran into this problem and I solved it. We'll ask the question, we'll answer it, and we use that as a resource. Uh, because Stack Exchange has that really positive experience for how you do self-documentation and asking questions and answers. JujuCharms.com in general, a lot of this contact information is replicated there. And then finally, if you're a developer you're looking to get started, this URL, I cannot stress enough, is the very short URL to a very long one that jumps you right into the getting started for the developer section of Charms.